Green energy is big news. That's getting bigger and bigger these days. For example, President Biden's $3.5 trillion budget includes measures for green energy, and many major companies are aiming to reduce their carbon emissions to zero. Did you know that of all the people in the world, some environmentalists are questioning whether or not green energy is truly green, and some even oppose green energy projects. In this episode, we'll explore the growing pains of green energy. Hey there, news peelers. Today is August 13, 2021, and this is Adele with the Peel Dot News. Once a week, we select a news item and peel the history behind it to gain perspective from the past. <laughs> oh boy, sometimes history gives us a good laugh, sometimes it offends, and sometimes it just, it just shocks. Like, did that really happen? I'm telling you, you can't make up some of this stuff that happened in our past. So grab a cup of coffee or your favorite drink or both and let's get into it. President Biden's $3.5 trillion budget plan, trillion with a T, includes measures for expanding green energy. And the private sector has already been pushing for green energy in a major way. For example, a couple of months ago, the Wall Street Journal published a lengthy comeback story about Arsted, a Danish oil company turned green energy icon. Really? An oil company turning to green energy? Yeah, and the Arsted Green Energy story is not a one-off. Exxon, an iconic oil company, is contemplating the reduction of its carbon emissions to zero by the year 2050. And Chevron recently announced a new business unit devoted to technologies that lower carbon emissions. BP and Royal Dutch Shell have also made public commitments to reducing their carbon emissions to zero. So, are these developments a good thing? Of course they are, right? It's green energy. Well, there's more to this story. According to the Wall Street Journal, environmentalists are opposing solar power projects recently in Nevada. Let me say that again. Environmentalists are opposing solar power projects. Not only some environmentalists don't want solar power projects in their own backyards, but they also point out that the energy for producing most solar panels comes from coal-burning plants in China. And it's not just solar panels. Recently, the New York Times published an article in which it attempted to answer the following question. Are electric cars really as green as they want us to think they are? And how about hydrogen as the fuel for future? Well, the New York Times cites a recent peer-reviewed study that suggests producing hydrogen for fuel may actually be worse for the climate than previously believed. And such stories are not confined to major newspapers and peer-reviewed publications. A shocking, just, just really eye-popping documentary on Amazon Prime titled Planet of the Humans basically stands for the proposition that green energy is headed down the wrong path. This is a 2020 Michael Moore film that was produced by Jeff Gibbs and features Al Gore and Richard Branson. So, to dig deeper and better understand the history of green energy, its development and its laws, we decided to speak with Ms. K.K. Duvivier. She's a professor at the University of Denver Sturm College of Law and Chair in Natural Resources Law. Professor de Vivier has won many awards, including the Teacher of the Year Award and the Excellence Award for Best Professor. 
In addition to teaching law, she is professionally engaged with many organizations. For example, she served as a trustee at large for the Rocky Mountain Mineral Law Foundation. She is also the author of the Renewable Energy Reader, a 2011 book, and the Energy Law Basics, a 2017 book. Before getting her law degree, Professor Dovivier received a degree in geology and interned in the mineral departments of the Smithsonian Institution and the Hudson River Museum. Later, she worked for a company as an exploration geologist, where she mapped and coordinated field operations in Colorado, Texas, and New Mexico. Professor Dovivier has also designed and built a near-zero energy home that has been frequently featured in sustainability tours and has won an award from the Colorado Renewable Energy Society. A link to Professor Dovivier's academic homepage, which includes a list of her publications and accomplishments, is provided in the detailed caption of this episode. So stay with me as Professor Dovivier and I peel the history behind. This news. This podcast is available on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Google, and Apple. And if you're listening to us on Apple, please write us a review and don't keep it to yourself. Tell a friend about the Peel dot News podcast. Professor Dovivier, it is such a pleasure to have you on our show today. Thank you for taking the time for this conversation with me.、Uh, I'm so eager to learn from you here, all about green energy. But we, before we do that, I, I gotta admit, I'm not at all sure that I'm even using the correct terminology here. There's so many terms that are used often interchangeably,、uh, such as renewable energy, clean energy. Green energy, sustainable energy,、uh, carbon-free or <laughs> carbon-neutral energy. You see what I mean? Are there market differences between these? Yes, it's a delight to be here, Adele. And those terms are thrown、My、around、pleasure. very loosely.、Um, and I prefer、uh, carbon neutrality because that really gets at the heart of the problem that we have now, and that is extracting carbon from our atmosphere so that. We can address the more dire consequences of climate change, and some people don't like carbon neutrality or decarbonization, which is another term that's used. It means taking the carbon decarbonization. Out. Okay, right.、Uh, some people don't like that because most experts think that includes nuclear power because it doesn't have any carbon emissions and carbon sequestration, which would mean you could still keep burning coal. But you're taking it out,、um, and mitigation, which you know they're talking about spreading particles in the atmosphere to try to, you know, cut back on the climate effects. And some people, you know, don't want us to think about any of those things, so they more often would just be using the term renewable energy, which is things.、Uh, in my first book, I was saying this is the story of the sun because all of the renewable resources are sun-driven, right? You have solar power, you have wind that's created by difference in temperatures on the Earth's surface. Due to the sun, you have hydrological cycle and hydropower, but that's sun-driven. So all of these things are pretty much sun-driven, except maybe geothermal, which is、uh, from the heat in the center of the Earth. So those are sort of the traditional renewable energies. So to to make sure that I understand correctly, the term renewable energy, and, and you prefer carbon neutral energy over that. The term renewable energy includes nuclear. Power. Am I correct on that, or no, the reverse? I mean, the reverse. Carbon、oh, okay, free. Okay. Yeah, carbon free includes nuclear, but renewable energy doesn't, and that's why some people pr- prefer that terminology. I see. Carbon free. What is the title of your first book? And、um, what was renew- it? Yes, it's called the Renewable Energy Reader, and I wrote it in response. I was teaching a class on energy law, and the Common law textbook on it had, I thought, very skewed perspective, saying things like no one would ever drive an electric vehicle, and, <laughs> you know, solar is way too expensive, and things like that. You know, just really out of date. When did you publish that book? That first book? Twenty, twenty. I have to look. 
2007, I think, was that one. Or okay. Well, anyway, no, 20. It's, it's not dated, so it, it 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 stays current with what's happening now. Well, and and my second book is called Energy Law Basics, and it's um it was about 2017, something like that. And one of my premises was that. It, you're outdated before it's even published because things change so quickly in this space. And that's one thing is that I teach my students up front is to check the latest data. I mean, solar prices, solar storage prices or battery storage prices have dropped dramatically just in the last year. So, you know, in the time that it takes to publish a book, you're out of date. So I tried to have <laughs> active links in my book that people could just go to the internet. And unfortunately the publisher was more into sort of traditional publishing so they didn't make those links active but um, the point that you're making that your book becomes outdated and that has to do with with the swift change in technology and that change in technology in turn impacts carbon neutral energy's availability and its feasibility right absolutely i mean the thing is that as, as one uh, i think it's tony siba who's one of my uh, favorite authors on this has talked about is that, you know, solar, for instance, solar and wind are technologies. They're, they're talking about how do we get it and how do we improve it? So like computers, they're just changing quickly and always improving and lowering in price. Whereas fossil fuels, they are running out. And so we're going farther and farther to try to get them. That's why they're trying to open up the Arctic, you know, because we've already expended all the United States and that's why we're doing offshore drilling and had deep water horizon. I mean, we wouldn't be drilling there if it were, more readily available in other places. Exactly, and and those new explorations, those new sort of virgin territories opening up have their own uh, um, set of issues and hazards that come along with them. Uh, Professor Dovivier, I asked you to clarify some terminology for me and you told me your, your preference for car carbon neutral energy. As a former attorney, I sort of all sorts of light bulbs went off when I was rattling off some of those names. Do any of the names, the terminology that I shared with you, green energy, renewable energy, uh, several of them, do any of them have any significant meaning that makes them preferable for government funding or tax purposes or other purposes so for example let's say california or the federal government has used the term renewable energy now everyone uses that but that, that's a hypothetical i don't know right and and so a, a common terms are renewable energy credits or renewable energy mm -hmm. goals and the the first movement was the federal government wasn't acting on this so states took the lead and in fact in colorado it was done through citizen initiative but a lot of state legislators start uh established was renewable. colorado one of the first states colorado was one of the first states to have yes um to have it by citizen initiative but also one of the first states but uh, i'll have to look back at the history of, of what state really was there were, were some that were quite earlier uh, but they step other way we can root for Colorado. That's right. We can root for Colorado. <laughs> <laughs> we were the first that did it by ballot initiative. And I've done a lot of work on initiatives. And so sometimes it takes the people saying, we want this to get something done. You know, yeah. the legislature is too entrenched in industry or whatever. Um, but, but in the, with the lack of federal action, states have moved forward and they really moved the ball forward on renewable energy. And so the goal initially was let's get renewable energy technologies that are not being supported already in place. So most of those renewable energy portfolio standards start out with things like solar and wind and not hydroelectric power, which was the, the major renewable energy source until just about last year when wind outstripped it. And but hydro had been subsidized by the federal government, as we all know, all that big dam building at the beginning of the 1900s. So, are you saying that in uh, the term renewable energy, as it came to be used uh, in 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 bills in the beginning, uh, and I don't know when time frame we're referring to, but at some time frame, that term renewable energy excluded hydropower because it was already being subsidized there was no need to include it is is that correct That's I, right. yeah um are the terms such as neutral carbon neutral energy that you prefer is that used 
in legislation legislative bills no it's it's kind of a newer uh concept with these renewable portfolio standards we had mm -hmm. you know the term renewable and we didn't have decarbonization but uh, some states like illinois are passing new legislation that are sort of mirroring the renewable energy credits they had zero energy credits and they were giving that to a nuclear power plant that already existed, but to just keep subsidizing and trying to make it work because they were recognizing there was some value to having a zero carbon energy source. Okay, so they're 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 actually being engaged with carbon neutrality, but they're not necessarily using the terminology carbon neutral energy. I got it. Now, now that we talked a little bit about definitions, um, let's get into the history of this, the background, really. Was there anything in the, gosh, I don't even know where to begin, like let's say 1800s or early 1900s, were there any references to hydropower, solar, renewable energy of any kind? Well, you know, solar power, solar energy, the concept of, of generating electricity through electrons that way went back to the 1800s. And so you know, some of the early people recognized that that would be a valuable source of power. Some people know uh, Werner von Siemens. I don't imagine the company Siemens in Germany was named for him. Yeah, is it that's um, like the the General Electric of um, Europe, uh, comparable right, in the back yeah. days? Yeah, okay. So he had created the dynamo, and when he heard about you know photo, what's the dynamo? Oh, it, it's a a generator for electricity. I see. So it moves when they figured out that you could move something in a circle and then create generate electricity through it. Okay. But but we he recognized back in the 1800s um that you know with the concept of solar being both without limit that solar energy is without limit and without cost that and it pours down on the earth every day. I mean in fact every day the earth produces enough power to the sun produces enough power to meet all of our electric needs if we could mm -hmm. capture it. Um, that basically, you know, he said that solar will be there after all the coal deposits have been exhausted and forgotten. And so people did recognize early that this had a lot of potential, but it took us a long time to get solar to the place where it's readily available. And now it's one of the least cost uh, sources of electricity generation. So it took us a long time somewhere, I suppose, in the mid 20th century, the concept of carbon neutral energy or renewable energy, at least, began to gain currency, right? Well, it's interesting because the the first impetus to fund research on solar energy um, didn't really come from the idea of carbon. We weren't that aware of the, the human impact on climate change. And, and so what happened first was that we realized, uh-oh, we're running out of oil in the United States. And we've moved all this oil production to countries that uh, are hostile to us. And so- Are you maybe, talking about like uh, Middle Eastern countries? Yeah, like uh, Iran and Iraq. Uh -huh. yeah. and, and, you know, the, the three of the top five are Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. Venezuela is another one. And, and then Canada, which hasn't been. But, you know, all these countries that we, um, they predicted M. King Hubbard, who worked for Shell, predicted in 1956 that the U.S. would reach peak oil um, in the 1970s. And he was right. That was You mean peak oil, domestic peak oil production? Yes, but I have to clarify because a lot of people get this confused. And I, I was a geologist, so I love to make this distinction. <laughs> You're an expert on this. Go ahead. deposits were con conventional. They're called conventional oil deposits. And how they were... Uh, extracted was that they were pools the, the oil would migrate through porous bodies and then be trapped somehow either in a uh, with a fault or an anticline and so that's what we were uh, drilling back in the 70s and we did reach peak conventional oil in the 1970s and um, but now with 3d seismic and um, directional drilling and fracking we've been able to get oil from different types of geologic deposits. So that's why if you look at a chart, US oil production did go up last year, I think or it, we were the world's number one, we reached, you know, historic highs, we still didn't meet all of our needs, we weren't independent, but we were significantly more independent with producing US oil because of fracking. 
But with respect to convention oil, which is really all they knew in the 1970s, mm -hmm, they realized, mm -hmm. uh oh, we're really dependent on this supply of oil from countries that are hostile. Let me see if I'm. I can. I, I, let me see if I can tell where you're going. You re, you refer to Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, 1970s, and we, we were reaching peak oil production. Are you are you inching towards the oil crisis in the early 70s? Is that where you're going? Right. So, so in 1973, under the Nixon administration, we had an oil, mm -hmm. you know, where the the oil countries finally figured out that they could uh, gather together and set a price for oil and have some impact on the West. We had a cartel. Yeah, and actually, <laughs> you know, who who uh, created OPEC was a Venezuelan who had studied in the United States and saw that we were doing the same thing in Texas, that they were basically oh, setting, wow. you know, limiting production in order to set a price. So they said, oh, well, internationally, we're going to apply that. And then we created OPEC. They created OPEC. Only we could, we could uh, uh, slap OPEC with the Sherman Act, right? That's right. Yeah, Some sort of antitrust. Do. Um, so this happens go ahead please this is fascinating yeah, so that happened in 1973 and so you know uh nixon became concerned with how oil was hurting us internationally and he tried to do some things about it but he actually uh did not try to develop renewables that was really jimmy carter's brainchild and from the beginning of when Jimmy Carter came into office in 1977, so even before there was another problem with the Iranian oil crisis, mm -hmm. uh, Jimmy Carter was pushing- Which happened in, uh, are you talking about Iranian oil crisis, the 1979 Islamic 79. Revolution? Okay, right. okay. But, in, but before that, in 1977, Jimmy Carter had already started to you know, push things toward the renewables. I mean, he was a nuclear engineer, so he was into innovative technologies. He established um, in 1977, he established the Solar Energy Research Institute that's out here in Golden, Colorado. Um, and it was, you know, developing new technologies, obviously focusing significantly on solar. Um, and then when the Iranian oil crisis happened in 79, he was saying things like, you know, we need to conserve. He had his famous sweater speech. He sort of dressed up like, uh, Mr. Rogers in a sweater and he was at the fireside <laughs> instead of being at the Oval Office. He gave the speech from the fireside chat in the library and was telling the American people that conserve energy conservation was an act of patriotism. And did that know, fly? No, that did not fly <laughs> at all. Reagan came into office under this, you know, new day in America. We're just going to consume away. And Reagan then, you know, tried to abolish the Solar Energy Research Institute. It's been since renamed the National Renewable Energy Lab. And, um, you know, one of our prominent Republican in Colorado said, wait, that's, you know, where I live and you can't take it away. So they didn't eliminate it, but they basically cut the staff. Gutted off. it. Yeah, they, they gutted it. Interesting. Uh, why don't we take a short break here and then talk about carbon neutral energy and its politics and our government. <music> Professor Dovivier, we think of Republicans <laughs> as being not so friendly to the environment, just generally speaking. But at least in popular culture, the two presidents that stand out for their impact, impact on the environment are Teddy Roosevelt for his national parks, famously, and Richard Nixon for establishing the EPA. And they were both Republicans. So in the history of carbon neutral energy, has there been a marked difference between Republicans and Democrats beyond what we see on, you know, popular news, Fox News versus CNN, that sort of thing. Right. And, and there is a stark difference between the parties when it comes to environmental laws in general and anyone who cares about climate policy. Uh, because if you care about climate policy, you would have to vote for Democrats now. And <laughs> we know that the parties have changed. A lot of people would say Re Reagan would not even recognize the current Republican Party. 
Um, but, you know, Nixon was a, an astute politician, but he also knew that there was bipartisan support for environmental laws at the time. He was dealing with a totally Democratic House and Senate who introduced these environmental bills that created the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, NEPA, in 1969, the Clean Air Act in 1970, the Clean Water Act in 1972, and the Endangered Species Act in 1973. So those are those are seminal acts. Those are really oh, profound the most, changes. I mean, we're talking right now about you know the Supreme Court said yes, EPA can regulate climate emissions through the Clean Air Act. So they're still using that act that was Nixon of all people. Wow. Right. Okay. Yeah. So you're saying this, this had to do with, with, mo well, maybe he really cared about it. We, I, I don't want to get into that, but it also had to do with the political realities of his time. Exactly. I think the political reality of his time was that, you know, he was dealing with these Congresses mm -hmm. that were passing it, that people on both sides of the mm -hmm. aisle cared about it. So he's going to sign it. But a few people do see, say he has a personal stake in it because the Santa Barbara oil spill in 1969 is seen as the beginning of the environmental movement. And he had beachfront property in California. Right. right. Yeah. So he went out there personally and said that, you know, that touched the conscience of the American people and obviously touched his conscience. You know? <laughs> hey, that's, that almost touches my property that's on the right. beach. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So, um, Going forward, how did how have the parties changed? Well, and and I think what I just want to talk about a little bit is the political football that we've had with mm -hmm. climate regulation. Please and do, again, yeah. I I, I think I, I didn't talk about this a little bit earlier, but you might want to weave it in, is that we talked about how in the 1970s, when we first started developing research on renewable energy and talking about renewable energy, we were worried about the peak oil and the fact that we weren't going to have oil. So it was a capital. matter of national security. Right, right. Okay. National security. But then okay. in, you know, the 1980s, we started realizing, uh oh, there's a bigger problem worldwide. We have this climate issue. And it wasn't until late 1988 that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change was created. And then in 1990, their first report said humans have an impact on climate. And what they've done consistently since then is um, expanded the consensus of scientists that have contributed to that report saying, that's right, and here's more evidence, and here's more evidence. I mean, they look everywhere in my class. I usually say, okay, here it is with respect to species. Here's the evidence of climate change with respect to sea ice. Here's the risk, you know. What the, are sea ice? Sea ice. You know, oh, I, sea ice. Uh, yeah. Sea ice as an ice on sea. Okay. I know. I got yeah. It. My, my I thought daughter, you were using an acronym. <laughs> no, my, my daughter works at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and oh, her wonderful. specialty is looking at the melting ice in the Arctic. So I, I'm used to using sea ice as a term like that. No, no. I, I got it. So yeah. she, does she live yeah. up in uh, uh, Alaska or somewhere in Canada? Or no, she no. She studies it from here in Boulder, but uh, she has been to both the North. Well, she hasn't been to the poles. Her husband's been to the South Pole, but she's been to Antarctica and she's been up north to, to see the consequences. Talk about adventures. Uh, yeah, wonder, yeah. That was a great digression. I love that. Oh, Thanks for good, sharing. Good. Um, in our previous conversation before this podcast, you, you shared a funny anecdote with me about, <laughs> I told this to several people and they busted up laughing. You said how uh, Jimmy Carter uh, sometime in the 70s puts up solar panels on, on the White House rooftop, and then President Reagan removes it. And I thought that was just very sort of uh, emblematic of the shift in policy. So how do we go from that shift in the time of Reagan? Then you mentioned uh, things were also ch changing by 1990. But in 1990, Bush Sr. was the president, still a Republican, and some could argue a protege of Reagan. Yeah, and I, I want to expand just a little bit on that Carter Reagan thing Please. because every time I show a clip in my class that I've just got off the internet, but when Jimmy Carter dedicated those solar panels on the White House, he said these solar panels could just be end up being a museum piece, or they could be the next great leap for humankind, something like that, <laughs> you know. And then, and then the video says. Um, basically that Reagan took them off the White House and they now are in a museum in China. 
So when you're the artist of these pictures, in China, they are a museum not, piece. Not not in the Smithsonian. It's no. In China. Oh, that is such a shame. I so, know it makes I, me cry. I know, me too. And I and I can't help but ask this question: Are there solar solar panels on the White House now? Yes, and you know what? It's interesting because who put them there? Which president? Well, I, I know. So you know, renewable energy became political, and it never should have been political. I mean, it course, makes yeah. sense. We all want to save the world. We don't want to have these climate fires and all these storms and everything else. But it became political, and so. Actually, George W. Bush put some of the first panels on the White House, and then he didn't, I never even could hardly see any reporting of that. But then when Barack Obama came in, he put more on, and there was a lot of coverage of that. But Bush did have some on the, you know, to heat the pool or something like that. Heating the pool is important, especially yeah. <laughs> if you do it with solar power. But so. Uh, go ahead, please. Yeah. So I do want to talk a little bit about the, you know, what happened between. So Carter in 1978, he uh, introduced a National Energy Act with energy goals and automotive mileage standards. So a lot of us know about what they're called CAFE standards, but corporate average fuel economy standards. And that means how far a car has to go, you know, on a gallon of gas. And those of us that are old enough, remember that Jimmy Carter had us driving at about 50 miles an hour so that we could get the best gas mileage and not be wasting gas. Again, because the focus was we don't want to be using Middle Eastern gasoline. Yeah. Um, but then basically, uh, if you look at the timeline under Reagan, the CAFE standard was temporarily decreased. And then, you know, it stayed at this lower level. And it wasn't until Obama came in that it, that it you know, became, became an issue again. And then Obama raised it significantly. And then, of course, Trump came in immediately and tried to get them to go back again. So you had this political... Are you football. referring to um, mandates by the government for car companies for their fleet to have an average miles per gallon? Uh, is, is, is that correct? That's correct. And okay. What that or turns out being, for instance, with, with the Obama rule, he wanted 54 miles a gallon. It means that a certain percentage of their fleet has to be electric in order to meet that goal. Which some companies even sell that at, at, at cost or sometimes at a margin of loss because they can sell these gas guzzling SUVs and make a lot of money, but they still stay within the government's mandate. Right. Correct? Okay. Yeah. Okay. So what happens? Well, I mean, so, uh, you know, I guess the Trump administration tried to change those and the Biden administration is currently trying to to bring them back up again. But, you know, it created this division. The industry, a lot of the car manufacturers mm -hmm. got behind it because they knew this is the way it's coming. And as you know, already the Biden administration has been pushing electric vehicles and there's some legislation coming in. So they were on board. But then when the Trump administration came in, you had a division of the car companies because a lot of them said, you know, we know that the future is an electric vehicle. So give us the incentive to do this. And some companies were saying, no, we're going to keep fighting for what, what was there before. And one thing that I show often in my class are clips from the movie, Who Killed the Electric Car, which is fairly old now, but it- Does that it, have to do with the DeLorean? No, it's the EV1 that the oh, California okay. Air Resources Board, that GM was experimenting with it in California. And uh, somebody who was on the board of GM said, this was our opportunity to be in the front of uh, developing electric vehicles. And he thought that they really blew it. And some of that had to do with government incentives. The government was you know, giving very low rebates for having a hybrid Prius or something like a thousand or 2000. And they were basically giving a complete tax write-off for the Hummer. So you know, no. an, account, an accountant said, you know, we have to tell our clients to buy a Hummer because that makes the most sense tax wise. I missed that boat, too. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't get our Hummer. Oh, boy. I, I was not aware of this. Um, where are we with the Biden administration on that? Yeah. I, or is I it guess, too early to tell? I think it's too early to tell. I'm not sure where that one went. I mean, another one that that often came up that you've seen is that. Um, 
basically California has been wanting to have stronger emission standards because it has a lot of air pollution. And so and Mr. They, Trump, I think, didn't like that. I'm just uh, speaking out of memory from a couple. Well, of years and again, ago. going back politically, the Bush administration opposed it, too. So we oh. the federal government gave them an, an exemption to go ahead and have their own higher standards. And then the Bush administration said, no, we're going to deny California that. And then they were in courts, you know. I, I train a lot of law students, so I have to say bless the lawyers for not letting these things change too quickly, because by the time Obama came in, he said, OK, government's not going to oppose. We're going to go ahead and let California have its own waiver. And then Trump comes in and says, no, California can't have its own waiver. So that's just been going back and forth. You know, of just, course, just back Biden, and forth uh, kind of uh, becomes a uh, uh, full Employment Act for some environmental lawyers, doesn't it? <laughs> it does, yeah. It does. Um, we talked about government. What um, I'm wondering now is, you know, we're not in the 1960s anymore. This is the 2020s. Is everyone is environmentally aware, if not conscious of it. Have big businesses, well, are big businesses having an impact on uh, on um, carbon neutral energy. I've heard the term uh, net zero carbon emissions, but I don't know how involved businesses are in this. You know, I, I talked earlier about how renewable portfolio standards in the states help push utilities to be generating a higher percentage of their electricity from renewable sources mm -hmm. that were defined by statute to not include hydro in many cases. But you know, in businesses are having a huge impact right now because you have, you know, about um, a lot, about almost 80% of global carbon emissions covered are now covered by net zero pledges from corporations. And the wait, re number wait, repeat that again, okay. please. 80%? So, yeah, eight, almost 80%. It's probably, maybe it's like 75. Uh, the share of global carbon emissions covered by net zero pledges. So they're saying about 75% of these emissions from different companies, companies have now pledged that they're going to try to deal with it. You know, so you even That's have, significant. Right. You have companies like British Petroleum, like if they're officially BP now or Shell saying, we're changing from being a fossil fuel company to being net carbon zero or... How and, can they do that? They're well, oil company. And that's, that's a, you have to look at the Is that just lip service? Well, no, some of it's lip service, but you have to look at the technologies too, because some of them are saying we are going to get into a different business model. We're not going to be searching for oil so much. We're going to actually be trading in renewables and things like that. I think BP maybe is doing that model. Uh, but others are saying, we're going to figure out ways to offset any carbon that we are producing. So we're going to work on carbon capture or we're going to plant a whole lot of trees so that we're carbon neutral, right? So I see, I see. That's why um, I like that term. Do right? any other businesses outside the oil industry have any impact? And and I don't have any research to back this. I just, just watching TV, you see a Google or Amazon commercial about the environment. It just makes well, me wonder. Yeah, recently I pulled up my Google search screen and it said, you know, zero carbon emissions since exactly. 2009 or seven or yeah. something. Yeah. And so what they were doing though, and this is sort of, again, the, the we as lawyer, or I don't remember if you were a lawyer, but Lawyers yeah, I was. I was a lawyer. Yeah, okay. We as lawyers can appreciate that the language matters, right? So it does. Early, early on, a lot of people would say we're 100 percent renewable, but they were still getting electrons from a coal-fired power plant nearby. But what they were doing is buying these renewable energy credits by, you know, saying, okay, somebody's got a wind farm in Oklahoma and they need some money, and we've got this tradable commodity called a renewable energy I credit. I see. So we have the bragging rights. So I had solar panels on the roof of my house, but I didn't have the bragging rights to say I was being 100% solar because the utility had bought the credits from me. See, they got I the see. bragging rights on the credits. But, well, but now people we'll give you the like, bragging rights here in this podcast okay, episode. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but, but, you know, now companies are saying, no, we really want it to be, you know, we want any power supplied to us, not just offset by credits, but actually generated by a renewable or clean, sustainable. Carbon That's a whole different power. level. Yeah. Yeah. So they have to maybe put it, have batteries so that they can have it, you know, uh, 
the reliability of the the most of the systems is 99% you're going to have your electricity. I don't know if that's still true with all the shutoffs in California. Yeah. And so forth. But, you know, the the uh, tech companies wanted nine nines, they called it, which meant 99.99999, nine digits out of reliability because wow. they don't want to lose the data, right? Of course. So they have their own backup systems, but they could either, and what's happened in California is when they have the shutoffs, some people choose fossil fuel backups like a diesel engine, right? And that doesn't help. It creates more pollution. It creates more, the cycle that yeah, we get into is now we're contributing more greenhouse gases. Now we're going to have more fires. But then others are doing battery storage, battery and storage, so that they they're have a clean solution. So a lot of the tech companies are saying, okay, we want clean backup, that kind of Clean thing. backup. Yeah. This or, is a... Um... Professor Dovivia, this is such a great segue for the next segment. Uh, why don't we take a short break? We'll be back to talk about our progress or perhaps some failures when it comes to developing carbon neutral energy. We hope you are enjoying this podcast. And if you are, then why not treat us to a cup of coffee? That's right. For the price of a cup of coffee, you too can become a monthly supporter of the Peel.News podcast. And it's easy. Just click the support link in the detailed caption of this episode. And while you're there, check out the information about our guests and attributions to our theme music. And thank you. Professor Dovivier, um, what's the status, I guess, kind of a report card of progress or failure when it comes to carbon uh, neutral energy? And, and, and a part of that question is, are there regions that are doing better or worse than others? You know, we have renewable resources all over the country. Uh, one mm -hmm. of the beautiful things about solar, for instance, is that all of the United States has better solar resources, including Alaska. We all have better resources than Germany, which was the number one solar country for many years. Um, and so we can develop it. And there's sort of a myth that like the southeastern United States doesn't have its great resources. Well, it's true that California and Mojave Desert have some of the most intense solar resources. And so that made some sense, but there's no reason for it not to be developed all over the country. Um, and so California, not surprisingly, I guess, um, has made some of the greatest strides and they've also run into some of the problems with it. They actually have so much solar being generated in the middle of the day that they, they don't know what to do with it. And they have to, what they call curtail, which means stop it. But really, you know, is that is, is storing it a, a technological uh, hurdle? Well, that's what so they are moving toward more storage. And the solution, I think, is more storage. And the other solution is I don't want to get too geeky here, but getting into demand side management, which means if people have electric cars, encourage them to charge them when all that solar power is being generated and the utilities aren't quite doing that right now. So if I may uh, interrupt you for one moment. For example, in Southern California, Edison and PG&E in Northern California, I'm familiar with both. They actually charge you less if you charge your, we have an electric car, um, char charge it at night after 10 p.m. So it's actually a disincentive for me to help with that, with, with, with regulating caliber, uh, that, that yeah. demand that you were. I'm getting geeky on you now. Well, no, that's what I love. And it's one of my most recent projects because I've been collaborating with some scientists who are saying, wait, 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 you know, these were time of use rates. And so traditionally, middle of the day was when most people were using power and then right at the evening. Uh, but now that there's so much solar in California, that middle of the day could be, you know, so for a while, solar was filling the need of the most valuable electricity, right? Because mm -hmm. that's when the most demand was. But now there's so much solar that the utilities are saying, well, actually, we don't want it all at that time. So they've created these incentives to charge at night. And, and you know, if the wind, obviously solar is not being produced at night, maybe the wind is blowing at night. So you are helping with renewables, but other nights the wind's not blowing. So these sort of antiquated rates are out of step. And we really need 
you know, we came from a system where it was turn on the coal fire power plant and the power goes one way and we don't have to think about it. And I know that a lot of utilities are, you know, scratching their heads and kind of their brains are exploding because it's so much more challenging to deal with different sources from different directions. Uh, but it's also a benefit there. You know, there's a value to flexibility of load, like and having micro grids, if you're going to have these fires, having storage and something in one area that you can turn off and not have the transmission, but still have it all working within an area. So we're trying to get people to change that model. But right now, yeah, there's a disconnect between some of what they're telling you to do with your electric vehicle and really what's happening. And so, you know, they're talking about having, we've got technologies now, we all know it's probably on your cell phone that yeah. they could tell yeah. it, this is the time to charge because now there's a lot of solar on the system or no, there's not wind tonight. So we don't want you to charge tonight, but instead they're kind of used to this old, we're going to tell you this hour period and we don't care whether, you know, it's wind or our old coal fire power plant that's providing the electricity for your car. Um, that, that, that sort of schedule of charge or you use your more electricity at night when there's less demand, that goes back to, gosh, when I was a kid. This was, that's been around for a long time. That's, so they haven't graduated. They haven't kept up with uh, technology, which brings me to this question. Do any, and let's talk about California because I'm familiar with it. Um, <laughs> I don't think, do, do any utility companies in California own solar power generation or do they con contract that out to solar power developers? Did, did my question make yeah, sense? Yeah, that makes it, a lot of sense. Yeah. And a lot of the early work for lawyers was uh, these independent companies or you know, investors would go and have a wind farm or solar farm. Yeah, in a startup or something, and it grows right, into and then a big they business. They would write yeah. the power purchase agreement from yeah, yeah. the utility to buy that. But more and more, is certainly definitely in, in Colorado and I think still in California, is the utilities realize that they can get rid of the middle person and just own it themselves, and then they can boast this and and they can they have their own. So there is there is, is that percentage of that ownership growing? In the last 10 years? Yeah, 15? there's been a lot of utility scale solar built, and I think it's being built by the utility. Interesting. Um, so it gets us back to, though, these vertical monopolies, which we had back in the Rockefeller days with oil, right? He owned mm -hmm. the, the oil wells, and then he owned the trains, and then he owned, owned the refineries. And so the electric utility industry, you know, they've been trying to break that up. Uh, they've been trying to say under, you know, Carter did some of this uh, PURPA, I can't even remember what the acronym is for, but it was, you know, uh, let's let these smaller solar facilities get online. We've got to give them a break. So we're going to force the utilities to buy some power from some of these qualified utilities, right? Mm -hmm. And so they can't have this monopoly of we own everything from generation to the customers that we're trying to break it up. And there's still a lot of discussion about, you know, having the utility of the future be basically just the customer service part and having nationwide transmission and, and then different generation sources so that you're opening up that market, making it more competitive. Um, is there any state in our country that's in the vanguard of progress or has made the most progress uh, than other states? Is there a tally? I know you're rooting for uh, Colorado. Yeah, but, no, uh, no. I unfortunately, I, I think Colorado's done some good things, but I don't think we're in the forefront. And if you look at the National Renewable Energy Lab statistics, uh, as far as the most of almost everything, so the most solar PV, the most solar thermal, which is like some of those power towers, the most geothermal, mm -hmm. California keeps coming up. It, it doesn't have the most hydro because that's where the dams were built. So a lot of, you know, Washington state places like that have it. Um, so, so California is usually in the forefront, but another state that's made a lot of progress is Hawaii. And that's, Hawaii. yeah. And that's because wow. it has a lot of sunshine and it, it had some of the highest, most expensive electricity in the country because they were actually, and this happens on a lot of islands they're not connected to uh, the grid. a transmission line, right? They're not connected to a grid. 
So for them, they didn't have big coal fire power plants. They would have these oil burning plants, you know, mm -hmm. so they, they had really, they have to import the oil and then burn the oil there. And so, you know, they, they've made a commitment to being hundred percent renewable. I think it's renewable in their case, uh, sooner than a lot of other places. They have a few growing pains with that and trying to deal with, you know, one of the things is, okay, everybody in this neighborhood has solar panels on their house. So the, the, the distribution line or the line that's coming in can't deal with all that, but we need some more over here. So they're looking at where should you be putting it? I mean, we, our country is not the best at planning ahead. We kind of <laughs> make the mistakes and then fix it. So, you know, they're, they're kind of a good place to watch and they're still dealing with we it. We kind of go through baptism by fire here. So uh, about Hawaii, the way uh, you described it is that they're doing this out of necessity. One, they didn't have coal, uh plants uh, and they were off the grip so you can't in an island uh, a cluster of islands you can't just use uh, oil energy forever you gotta that's right. that, that, that's a good testing ground for the rest of our country yeah and a lot of people have said that transmission is key because you know it while the sun may not be shining over here it's shining there or even if a cloud goes over you don't want the power to stop so it's the the, the broader the range the better renewables work, right? Because the wind's coming through and it's blowing here and then it's not, you know, so as long as you've got it somewhere along the line, you're generating power. You know, in talking about carbon neutral energy and renewables, we touched on progress. I wanted um, to talk about a film that I recently watched. It's by Michael Moore. It's it's kind of a special interest documentary. It's on Amazon. It's called Planet of the Humans. And I think it's also on YouTube. Uh, some stars such as Al Gore and Richard Branson and also the famous author and environmentalist Bill McKibben are all in it. Um, I got to tell you, for me, watching the film was just a big downer. <laughs> I mean, it was just hard to watch the film. And the message was basically is that we're doomed. Green energy is not green at all because I'm just sharing what I learned from the film because it takes more fossil fuel energy to build a, a renewable energy or a carbon neutral energy plant. So kind of why do it? I'm not interested in talking about the film, Professor Dovivia. I I'm interested to talking about the premise for which it stands sort of. Is, is is this too much? Is it too dramatic? Is it, 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 it? And it was sort of saying that how environmental environmentalists are opposing these solar plant developments. It, does well, this comport with reality? Yes, I watched that film too, and I'm actually a pretty big Michael Moore fan. So I was disappointed that that he and he didn't actually, as I understand it, he wasn't maybe. Really, he just supported the film and the Gibbs or someone else created. Yeah, I think Gibbs was a director. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, I would have given that director probably failed my class because one of the first things <laughs> that I tell my I think he won't be enrolling in your classes. <laughs> that's right. He said, Here's warning: Do not yeah. come to my class because there were so many errors in that film. You know, I mean, one of the first things I teach my students is it has to be up to date. You know, I think I told you my textbook had links so that I knew the book was already out of date. Yeah. And so, you know, he had uh, data that was more than 10 years old and this perpetuating this myth that solar is just too expensive. No one's ever going to be able to afford it. And as I told you, it's one of the least cost ways of generating. It's definitely cheaper than coal and it's low in many parts of the country, natural gas, because Coming back to that, you know, discussion that Siemens said, hey, it's free. So once you build the plant, you've got it, right? And so that was just, that was so out of date. And then the logic was so poor, uh, you know, to say, okay, um, because there are some problems with renewable energy, then it's not any better than fossil fuel. Well, that's been refuted over and over. Like, for instance, one of the things that I hear people say is, okay, I've got an electric vehicle, but I'm charging it from the utility that's burning coal to make the electricity. That's kind of mm -hmm. what the film was saying, yeah. Right, yeah, and and but that's been refuted by scientific evidence. I mean, first of all, it's sort of a bad premise to start because with these renewable standards, maybe the year you bought the car, it was 90% coal, but in two or three years, it's gonna be only 
40% coal or less and less because those utilities are moving toward renewable sources. So that's already wrong. But then there have been studies to say, no, the amount of energy, you know, you're using the electric vehicles more efficient and, and it, it can run. So even if it were like a 90% fossil fuel burning source of electricity for your electric vehicle, you're still emitting less carbon than you would if you were driving the car with gas. So there were just so many errors that way that it was it was so frustrating. And you know, you talk about environmentalists opposing renewable projects. Well, that's unfortunately not new. Um, I mean, it's not new. It's not new. And and I I do agree with. I mean, I do agree with one premise that these environmental groups in the movie may have had to was that Americans are incredibly wasteful. We're, we're you know we consume at least double per capita of energy that Europeans do in, I think at least six times what a Chinese person would do. And, and so we're extremely wasteful and that's causing this problem, not really, you know, that any human activity has a consequence and we do need to mine if we're gonna have any resource. And so to say, well, you know, coal mining is, We've been doing that, so let's just keep doing that versus some other kind of mining in the renewable space. You know, it's it's clear that there's less impact, or you can do with less impact. And as we learn, we can do different things. Like, you know, one of the problems that they complain about the lithium ion batteries is or that they require cobalt. And I know that Elon Musk has been trying to get the cobalt out because there are concerns. Most of it's mined in the Dominican Republic and uh, they have artisanal miners, which means people who aren't part of a mining company, and then they make their children carry some of it. So, you know, there are human rights questions. Of but course, once yeah. they know that, then Musk is saying, okay, let's try to reformulate this so that we don't use the cobalt or, you know, there are going to be some trade-offs. And, and the National Audubon Society endorsed wind power, for instance, because they said, okay, the number of birds that are killed by wind turbines is way less in buildings, way less in cats, and way, wait, way wait, less. Wait. Birds than killed change. by buildings? Yeah, buildings. The birds fly into your window. <laughs> no, I know that happens. I mean, we've, I've actually, in the last nine years that we've owned this home, that's happened three times. But is that just such a big, huge number that actually... I, I think I read that New York City, it, maybe it was in a year, had more bird deaths than all of the wind turbines in the country. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I don't know why birds would want to fly over New York City with all the noise <laughs> and pollution. Um, I've, I've come across um, several um, articles uh, about uh, the opposition of environmentalists to uh, renewable energy or carbon neutral energy projects and they were all those several articles had to do with solar power i noticed again this is my uh, sort of lay person's uh, view into this you're the expert um but what i noticed is this it seemed like some environmentals whether it's the autobahn society whether it's it's whatever syrical whatever it is they are for renewable energy carbon neutral energy but but not in my backyard. <laughs> am I? I mean, is that? Am I sort of in the ballpark well, with that? Am I correct? You're well. That's you know. Some people think I'm not being fair, but I actually wrote an article said from NIMBY, which is not in my backyard, to no, not on planet Earth. I did not <laughs> know that. What a coincidence. Okay. All right. So, so I, I do think that a lot of people, again, they're not taking ownership of the consequences of their actions, and I know that you know. Um, detractors when you when we would have meetings about some of this would say well okay you all don't like what we're doing here but how many of you drove here in a gas powered powered car you know uh -huh. and it would be the majority of the audience had to admit yeah. that they had this vehicle that obviously materials had to be mined and they were using oil but they opposed what was happening here because they didn't want to look at it but i i do want to come back to saying i still do think that we, we have not done enough with energy efficiency. There's a lot to do with that. I talked a little bit about the wonky concept of demand side management, but it's yeah. like charging your car when the power is actually being generated. And so those could make a huge difference. But otherwise, if we're- Don't regulations need to be changed for that? Yeah. For, for, that for utilities to incentivize people to 
we like charge their cars a smack dab in the middle of the day because most people well the goal is ultimately i think they call it um transactional energy so that you would get a signal that the price of energy went down so your car would automatically say oh now's the time to charge because the, be wonderful the price goes down because it's being generated so hey why don't i get it you know having that sort of app message your phone it's that technology exists it does and and some of it has to do with utilities putting in some some meters but when you put you know solar it's not exorbitant it wouldn't be impossible to have smart meters on on most of the houses and things like that so there there is a solution there i agree uh, with that i'm sorry were you going to add something yeah so so i was just going to say you know um with uh, the opposition you might have the national audubon society saying more birds are being killed by climate change than wind turbines so we support wind turbines and the locals saying we don't want the local audubon society opposing yeah. the wind project <laughs> But but what I I've been a big advocate of is distributed uh, resources. I think solar. Well, somebody said solar plus storage is the next killer app, and I do agree with that. You know, it's a killer app. It <laughs> means that it's going to be the thing that changes the future. But solar is the most beautiful thing because it doesn't need any water. It doesn't make any noise. It doesn't have any moving parts. Solar PV, and you can put it on your roof. And so I think there's so many rooftops. In an urban yeah. area, that if you could do solar and storage there, then you wouldn't have to have these huge solar mirrors out in the middle of the desert. You know, we do have some trade offs. We have to look at it. Some of that is needed. So you'd have to say, okay, do I need a new vehicle every few years or whatever we're doing with consuming? Are we willing to make that change in order to cut back on the need for electricity? So I, I think it's possible, but it does take a change in mindset. And that didn't go over too well when Jimmy Carter put on his sweater and said, we have to conserve. People were much happier with the message of, you know, the gates are open again, all the pumps, the gas. Maybe pumps, he should have, know. maybe he should have commissioned Mr. Rogers to do it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and I, I do like to say, you know, at least some of the messages changed because conserving doesn't, doesn't sell well, but efficiency sells better. And, you it know, does. you don't have to always sacrifice to get a better deal like a, you know, Elon Musk's electric vehicles are better that, you know, they're, they're much better than a gas powered car. So I think and you most get people, to show off with it. Oh, exactly. look at my Tesla. Exactly. Or you yeah. have the smug, you know, they said instead of smog, <laughs> we have the smug factor. <laughs> Especially up in the San Francisco Bay area. Yeah. Um, let's take a break here. Stay with me and Professor okay. WVA as we get into the perspective. Professor Dovivia, we sort of touched on this in the previous segment, uh, but I, I want to bring it to the fore. And, and I'll give this analogy. Most Americans are familiar with the growing pains of the social media industry, all the things that can go wrong with being on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. It has benefits, but it also has a lot of side effects. And during President Trump's uh, administration, it even spelled into politics in a major way right so and and the industry the social media industry it's learning its way it's it, it's it's evolving so using that analogy we talked about opposition we talked about things that are going right the grid the 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 uh, timing during the day and everything else is the carbon neutral energy industry also going through a process of growing pains uh evolving you know, absolutely. Um, actually, the the beginning, the beginning of almost every chapter in my book, Energy Law Basics, starts with a timeline. That's I a think 2017 book, right? Yeah, right. And, yeah, okay. and I thought it was important for students to try to put things into perspective. And as I told you, the book would be out of date immediately, but at least they'd have the history there. <laughs> yeah. So, so I was sort of trying to set this in for myself to understand. And I, I actually have written one article called Sins of the Fathers. And my uh, premise was that because we messed up in oil and gas and with mineral severance and so on, we shouldn't make these same mistakes, but wind is kind of over a hundred years behind all these other things. And so they're going through those growing pains that, that oil and gas or mineral extraction was going through over a hundred years before, you know? And so 
obviously and they went th through so many regulatory changes and, and, and technological changes. Yeah. And, and some of the, you know, representatives in Congress I've talked to said that, you know, the renewables, they came, they're coming in under a whole new regime. You know, we had, we didn't have the uh, environmental statutes when all these dams were being built. And what happened when some of those dams came up for renewal is, oops, they're not going to pass it. You know, they're causing endangered species there. So what do you do? You tear them down? Well, they, they've closed down some of the dams. Oh, wow. You know, yeah, I mean, originally with coming back to Teddy Roosevelt, I think he was visionary. But and one of the things is when they first were uh, licensing dams, some people didn't want there to be any end. I mean, we Americans, again, we aren't very good at planning ahead and we aren't very good at planning the, the end game with mm -hmm. respect to nuclear power plants or dams. And so they were like, oh, well, we'll just give them the license forever. And Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, so you mean, but they didn't want any end. You mean they wanted a license in perpetuity. Right. But they didn't think about ever, well, someday maybe this dam should come down or if the dam comes down, you know, who pays for that? You know, we have that legacy all over the country, all these abandoned mines and abandoned oil and gas wells, and there's no one around to kind of clean that up now. And so, so Teddy Roosevelt, he said, well, 50 years for a dam. So they had to come up for a relicense. So when they came up for the relicense, after all these environmental statutes had passed, some of them didn't, didn't, couldn't make it through that process. <laughs> yeah. But you, so now you've got, you know, wind and solar, which are all after those statutes. So that makes it, you know, they're expected to be at this higher standard where they have no environmental impact. Don't kill any birds or, you know, uh, that the, they're, they're visual. I mean, the biggest complaint generally is aesthetics for solar or wind. Um, and aesthetics. And, Aesthetics, right? People don't. But most like of these things look. are done out where there's less traffic. Well, we had Martha's Vineyard. I mean, look at you know Cape Wind and the oh, disaster that's right. yeah, there. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah, why. Yeah, yeah. I mean, one of my latest areas is offshore wind, but you know that industry. We're over a decade behind Europe with respect to offshore wind, and a lot of it has like to do with places like Denmark. Yeah, right. Yeah, Denmark's one of the leads, but actually the UK is number one in the world for offshore wind. Um, but, but, you know, so yes, we're going through growing pains. We've had a tax structure that's totally different. There are a lot of ingrained things. And I even argue that, you know, the highway system is a subsidy for internal combustion engines, right? And we had obviously a lot of government support for hydro. We had a lot of government support for nuclear. And actually there's something called the Price Anderson Act, which limits liability of nuclear uh, people using nuclear power, or else they said they weren't going to get into it. So we've had all this government kind of subsidy in addition to whatever money subsidies they've gotten that renewables don't have. And one of the things that I was arguing in Colorado is that they have a statewide commission that says, here are the rules for oil and gas. And the statewide commission is, you know, originally was just loaded with industry insiders saying, here are all the rules. And so counties couldn't prevent drilling wherever they wanted or whatever the rules were, whereas wind and solar, you know, and, and so when finally the Colorado, for instance, said, okay, we're going to let local governments have a say in this oil and gas industry said, oh, no, no, we couldn't have that. That would just be too hard. We couldn't manage. Well, wind and solar have always had to deal with every local government having a say. And I've got oh, wow, examples. Which makes it uh, so much more expensive and right. time consuming. Yeah, and I had an example in New York State where one county approved the wind turbine, but it crossed the county boundary, so they had to sue the other side. And by the fine time they got through with the lawsuit on that side and got approval, the council had changed on this side, and they didn't approve it anymore. So, you know, that wind farm, I think, has still not been built. <laughs> Versus uh, a fossil fuel um, company comes and, let's say, they, 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 they can be rest assured that the entire region, a jurisdiction, a state, has the same right. law and they just go up and down the state do exactly what they want to within the confines of the law that's fascinating i did not know that now we're talking so much about law here <laughs> and uh, you know i i know you're you practice law and later became a, a professor of law but you had studied geology uh, initially and actually worked in the field for several years is there anything from that experience that you'd like to share with us yeah, and I, I'm actually going to take from one of my classmates as opposed to myself. And and uh, he was a geology major with me at, in Williams. And he went to graduate school in 
Alberta. And he, he was the head of our outdoor club and just loved to hike and do all those things. And then for the majority of his career, he worked in the oil industry. And then once he retired, he, he went back to, to Canada and he was just devastated because he said, all my glaciers, they're gone. Oh, wow. I bet. Um, yeah. A couple of things to add to that. One, I've, I, I have been to Alberta, I've vacationed there, uh, driven around Alberta, around Calgary a lot. And you see, you see how um, uh, glaciers have receded and they tell you there are plaques and what have you. But the place where I was most affected by how uh, glaciers had receded was actually in Seward, Alaska southeast kenai peninsula my wife and i many years ago did a road trip and when we went there uh, you know you park and you walk along this path and there are markers spiked along the road and it says for example 1810 this is where the glacier was 1820 18 we walked for about a mile before we got to the glacier wow. it, it was so sad i mean you can't make it more visually impactful than that so yeah. i certainly uh understand what your uh former classmate was saying maybe he should have visited alberta more often that's the lesson well, go I back home he, and visit he, he's one of those sad people that at the end of his career feels like wow i really made a mistake <laughs> <laughs> um well hopefully he can make make up for some of that right yeah um before we end our conversation here, Professor Vivier, is there anything else that you wish to share with me, with our audience? Yeah, I think, you know, one of the things I see with renewables is that some people think of it as the easy answer. Like just say, okay, as long as we go 100% renewable, everything will be fixed and scientists will take care of it. It but, won't? Well, as I said before, you know, every human action has an impact. And so that, you know, exorbitant, use of energy that Americans have, as I said, it's, you know, more than twice of Europe and their standard of living is equivalent and, you know, more than six times China, is that that we are making choices and we need to think about it. And again, we don't necessarily all have to sacrifice a lot. There are ways of, for instance, you know, having cooling with heat pumps as opposed to using an air conditioner, which is just contributing back to the climate problem. So I think we have to all look at ourselves and just say, you know, we are part of this problem. We care about the solution, but we all have to go in there and, you know, maybe have something that we didn't like in our backyard, or we need to change some of our behaviors because we have a limited world. And we Professor Olivier, I don't know if you've been spying on me or not, but you just made me feel guilty because about 45 days ago, we just got a new AC. Uh -oh. And, and, but, but I have a point in, in relation to what you just said, the, the option of getting a heat pump instead didn't even come up. None of my brothers, father, father-in-law, cousins, uncles, you know, we all talk about these things. This is what I'm doing. No one knows about these options. No one in, in, and these are relatively inform people they like the environment is, is yeah. that is that an issue lack of information lack of sort of I, I, and i don't mean for a clique of people that are super interested in this i mean just the general population yeah i used to have a quote i i'm sorry i can't remember the author <laughs> of it said there's nothing as destructive as habit and i think you know what we were seeing is that builders don't build the more efficient buildings because they want to do it the same way as their predecessors exactly. or the way they've always done it. And I actually, you know, I knew enough uh, coming into this house that I'm in to say the, the previous, when I bought the house, the previous owner said, well, the gas boiler is 50 years old. We'll replace it before you come in. I said, no, 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 don't do that. I, I want to change what I have in the house to the heat pump because I knew it was efficient and it's electric. And they're talking about electrification of buildings. We passed a bill in Colorado to encourage a beneficial electrification, they call it. Um, but for it, residential uh, structures as well as commercial. Yeah, yeah, for for yeah for for residential as well as commercial. Um, and you know, your air conditioner is electric, but it's not as efficient, and it uses some fluids that keep it. You know, of course, fluid. yeah. 
Uh, so the and Freons composition. have changed over. Or, or, right. I mean, that's a, that's a brand name, but that composition of that chemical has changed over the years. But I even had the same problem as you did when my gas hot water heater. So so I changed all the heating system. I don't have uh, any gas in there anymore. But I wanted to go completely gas free, but my hot water heater went out. And I asked the repair guy, you know, can I get something other than gas? And he basically said there weren't any other options. And, you know, you're kind of over the hill. You don't, you, yeah. you, you need your hot water. So I went with it. And, you know, I regret that because now I've made a 10-year investment or something in gas still. But the goal is, and I think some of that's what some of the Biden administration's plans are. Definitely states, people are awakening, but there's not enough information out there. And we Certainly have to not. get we have to get the people who are doing the work to say, oh, here's some of your options as well. Yeah, I think giving more options to people, readily available options to uh, the general population is is important because even those that are interested, I'm interested. I called you, I contacted you for this podcast episode, but I don't have that information for me to yeah. know that there are options. Well. Professor Dovivier, thank you so much for educating me and our listeners. You're welcome back to the PL.news anytime. And to our listeners, if you have any history that could provide more perspective from the past on this subject, please share it with us and tell us what's your perspective. The opinions and statements of our guests are their own. We neither agree nor disagree with them. We're only interested in the perspective they provide through history. At the Peel.News, we're honored that our guests share their expertise with us, most of which are based on years of scholarship and research, and we provide links to their projects and publications for your benefit, to review them if you wish. Otherwise, we're not affiliated with our guests. We just think they teach us pretty cool history the history behind our news. Also, unless we explicitly inform you, we're not affiliated with any institutions, including Amazon, for which book links are shared here from time to time for your convenience. Finally, as a reminder, we don't do news here at the peel.news. We peel the news for the history behind it. And our mission is not to provide a complete account and analysis of the past, rather is to highlight some issues and incidents in our history that may poke and prod your discerning minds into seeking some perspective for our current events. And if you disagree with our take on history, well then, it means we've succeeded in getting you to think about the history behind news. And of course, Share your thoughts with me by leaving comments about this episode on our Instagram page at thepeel.news. I love to hear from you. I love to learn from you. Until next time, this is Adele with Appeal.news.